Okay, so the idea is that we're just going to run through both Rays Online reports, have a think about Rays Online in the context of all the other data that's available. I think it's useful for senior teachers to be here and for us to do the same workshop for governors as well because you've probably only got an experience of either an infant raise or mm -hmm. a junior raise. Um, so that's what we're going to try and cover. I'm going to go through it quite quickly because what I'm going to do afterwards is send round the raise online so that you can have a look at it in a bit more detail. So this isn't actually we're not going to be analysing both ways online here, we're just going to be thinking what sorts of questions uh, we, we need to have a look at. There are some offset expectations in terms of governors in particular, but also for you in terms of your understanding of where we are externally with the, with the data. Um, and there's some reasons there as to why we should use data. And I think there's a bit of a uh, a warning that I'd sound to that, which I'll get to in a minute, and hopefully that noise will die down in a minute. But in terms of useful data for school leaders, Raise Online gives us four opportunities. It allows us to look at how our pupils do by their different groups. It allows us to think about how we use that moving forwards, um, how we compare to other schools, and also a good deal of reflection. But, but with that, there's some understanding that, say for example, for our current year six, um, their journey's been a seven year one. So they started their journey in inception seven years ago. So as I was saying, it's about asking the right questions. Looking at Raise Online certainly isn't going to give you an explanation as to why various groups might achieve or not, but it will get you to uh, to ask the right questions. <coughs> I thought this was interesting, I and mean, this is taken from the National College slide in terms of the use of data, just to emphasise um, the sorts of questions that you might incorrectly ask when you look at data. Here is some data about prisoners and students. Any idea what those two square metres have to do with? Is that to do with maybe um, the size of the cell that they're in? Yep, eight and a half square metres is the minimum cell space that you are recommended to have in Europe. Uh, four square metres is the teaching space that you're supposed to have if you're a secondary school student. What questions does that ask? Does that raise? Anything? And I think they've used this just as an illustration to show you how data can be very, very dangerous because you can jump to all sorts of different conclusions. I suppose the reality is secondary school students don't stay overnight in the this, in this, in this classroom, they don't have a bed, so it's almost an unfair comparison. So you've really got to be careful when you look at data that you are clear on the framework within which you operate and the sorts of questions that you ask. We won't do this. Um, because I want to really crack on through here. But here's some of the questions uh, that you might want to just take a check on and see if you, you can answer all of those. Okay. What is Raise Online? That's what it stands for, if you're wondering. Anybody remember what Raise Online replaced? Panda. Panda. Um, key point for me, it's historic. So the infant school raise online, so those children that were educated in the infant school from 2011 to 2014, juniors it's 2010 to 2014, with progress based on that data from before, so that's 2007. It doesn't reflect the attainment and progress of current cohorts. Uh, there's some information there about how Raise Online is basically put together. The version that we've got now is an unvalidated set of data. 
uh, the validated data comes out in January, and it's the validated data that is used to put in the lead tables. Um, so there are some gaps in some of the data that we'll look at. This is some guidance from the National Governors Association about what their role should be with Raise Online. Um, their view is that in the autumn term, somebody from the school leadership team presents uh, a summary report from Raise Online to Governors. Uh, we're going to try and do that slightly differently this term in that we're going to record this, send the Raise Online out, give Governors an opportunity to think about any questions and then we'll look at this in the first meeting in January in, in the spring term. And it may be that Governors decide that they're going to look at other data uh, in a slightly different way. First thing to think about is the school's context. Now as I go through this, each slide will either be the infant school or the junior school and I'll let you know where they are and what I've tried to do is to put the same bits together so we're not going to look at the whole of the infant school, we're not going to look at the whole of the junior school, we're going to look at each bit in turn. So here's the context, first question for us to ask is how might our context affect our pupils' performance? I put in a useful little guide there because I would say that in Ofsted terms they're only really interested if you're well below average or well above average. If you're slightly below average or slightly above average it's not going to make too much of a difference. That was a discussion we certainly had around starting points in the last infant inspection where we were arguing that children's entry point was below, significantly below average and the inspection team wouldn't have any of it. If you use this as a guide, you can see that the, the only two key factors in terms of the basic characteristics of the infant school that are well below or well above, well below the national number at school action or with a statement, and well above in terms of stability. So you might look at those two indicators and say, actually overall this is a, a school that is pretty much in line with what you would say the national average is, there or thereabouts. Therefore, your assumption might be that if progress was to be expected, it might be somewhere in line. If it was typical progress, it might be somewhere in line with the national. Okay? And there's the basic characteristics of the children last year by year group. Boy heavy in year two last year, even more boy heavy in this year's year two and girl heavy in uh, reception last year. Which is very interesting when you look at the performance of the different genders in the data. There's an argument that it's easier to attain highly with a cohort where there are a high proportion of girls. It's not as simple as that. Um, there you go. Junior school. Junior school, well above in terms of size, and that's the only really significant variable across the range. However, I do think there's something important to look at in terms of eligibility for free school meals, because at 39.5%, that's only slightly below the threshold to be well above the average for free school meals. And there's the context of last year's cohorts in the junior school. We have three that are boy heavy and a girl heavy one in year three that's now going to, to year four. Okay. In here you've also got the attendance and exclusion data. In your validated report you haven't got this year's data. A couple of things to point out here. This is the infant schools data. You've got three figures. For persistent absence, 15% or more sessions, the school is here at 4.5, the national average for primary schools is 3.6, but the median trend line for free, for the schools, free school meals level is 4.2. In other words, that does tell us that the free school meal trend line is slightly higher than the national, so it doesn't look quite as bad against um, the free school meal level as it does against the national. And in fact, when you look at the overall attendance, a little bit further down there, you can see that the overall attendance is slightly lower than the national, but it is slightly better 
down the sort of trend line for the free school meal equivalent. Okay. So again, it's just another aspect uh, related to context. Same data for the junior school. You can see here that you've got 3.7 compared to 3.6 national and 4.6 for the free school meal trend line. And, and we, we've looked at the fact that we're towards the higher end of the above average, more, more closely aligned with well above average at key stage two. So actually attendance compares favourably both for persistent absence and sessions missed to similar schools with similar proportions of free school meals. Okay. And at the bottom of that you've also got information relating to exclusions. And you can see that the exclusion rate at key stage two is above the national average for primary schools. Okay. But we've had no permanent exclusions. And that exclusion rate is also there for key stage one as well. So that's just a, bit, a bit of information around the context. In terms of getting started with, with uh, Raise Online, the simplest way of looking at this is that there are two colours that are on there. They are blue, which is not good, and green, which is good. And the word significant, they use the word significant and they define it by saying that it's confident that it's not the result of chance. So it's something about what the school's doing or not doing that is leading to it performing significantly above or significantly below the national. Okay? Um, a lot of the information in RAISE is in actual levels, but there's also quite a bit that still relates to the average point score and Again, there's a few questions you can ask there about how many points is a 4A, but we know that level 2, 15 points, level 4, 27 points, that's two levels of progress, that's expected progress. We know that with sub-levels it doesn't quite work like that at key stage 2. So at key stage 2, you can actually make three levels progress with only progressing through seven sub-levels, if that makes sense. Okay. Similarly, you can um, make two levels progress without by moving from a, a two A to a four C. Okay. And a really important point: it's all going next year, so we don't know what Maze Online is going to necessarily look like at this stage, which is not a reason for not analysing the data that's there within it. But I wouldn't worry about understanding it to the nth degree because it's all going to change. So, we've mentioned about point scores. Here's a typical average point score summary at the beginning of the infant school raise online. As I said, all the data that's in here is either the infant or our infant or junior school. So, you can see that for the last five years, apart from 2012 in writing and maths, it's been significantly above the national average. If we go back to the school's context, the school is broadly in line with the national context. Attainment is significantly above year on year. Okay. The biggest difference between the two grades online reports is that the infant school, mm. aside from uh, this year having information mm. causing the gap reports being included, the infant school is focused solely on attainment. And the key stage two report is always significantly longer and more detailed because of an equal weighting with progress, so a very big focus on progress. Okay? Again, significant is confidence that it's not a result of chance. Okay? And that's how it's defined. So if you think about this in terms of an Ofsted inspection, there's an assumption there that the school must be getting something right to get those grades. Here's the junior school average point score for the same period. You can see the blue for all subjects and the blue for maths last year, which meant that maths was a real focus for the junior offset inspection. You can see that the green appearing in reading for 2014, but also the other uh, important symbol, if you like, in race 
And the arrows and the arrows talk about trends over time. Okay? So if it's not green, but there's an up arrow, then it's a positive sign. If it's green and an up arrow, it's a really positive. So whenever you look through a race, if you're spotting green, it's good. If you're spotting arrows going in the right direction, it's good. And I suppose a key question for us to ask, and this is where it's very difficult to get that information from an infant school race online, where is it that we need to focus our attention? You'll see as we go through that there's quite a bit for us to think about in the junior school with that. A um, couple of other things just to think about. Always check your sample size. Often inspectors won't pay any attention to groups of between one and five children. And I would say anything below 20 as a group size in a cohort of ours is fairly small. Fairly small. So you, you can't read into, for example, the, the achievement of children from the ethnic minorities if there's 12 or 13 in a year group and there's a various other factors that, that might be at work with those children. However, over a number of years, if there's a consistent pattern with those smaller groups, then it might be something to consider. But with the smaller groups of both the infants and the juniors here, there isn't. There isn't a consistent pattern. So, five types of indicator. Attainment is, in effect, the standard that they reach, how high they get. Very important when he thinks about readiness for the next phase in education. And point scores are useful, but often they're increasingly shying away from point scores because what point scores do is they gloss, gloss over any issues that you might find within a cohort. And then progress at key stage two is measured two ways. There's expected progress, which is two levels, and more than expected progress, which is three levels. And then there's value added. Value added, in effect, measures their progress from key stage one to the end of key stage two and gives it a numerical value. Now, 100 for value added is seen to be uh, neutral, if you like. And if it's over 100, then you're adding value. And if you're un under 100, then you haven't added the value that you need to. So they're the different measures within both of those reports. For the rest of this, I've really highlighted which of the reports I've taken it from, because some of these tables aren't in both. Clearly, this table, your average point score at key stage one, is only in a primary school or a junior school raised online. I think it's a really interesting question to ask, particularly in Ofsted terms, if we had as a federation one raise online report, what would that say about the federation from reception to year six? How would we compare to a primary school with that same set of data? But you can see that for all the cohorts last year, apart from year four, the starting point was significantly higher than the national. The assumption, therefore, is that those cohorts, if they just make expected progress, will finish significantly higher than the national. And this percentage coverage here highlights the fact that we don't have much mobility compared to other schools. And there's some information here about the different attainment bands within the school. And actually, here's an aspect of the junior raise that we didn't understand this year that we had to go and ask Duncan for an explanation for because it didn't seem to make sense, and that was all to do with these prior attainment bands. So, in terms of attainment data, something to be aware of, that the, there is a floor standard at key stage two. There isn't a floor standard at key stage one, but there is a floor standard at key stage two. You've got to get more than 65% of your children uh, level four and above in reading, writing and maths. Uh, if you don't do that, then you've got to make sure that it's above the median for two levels progress in reading, writing and maths. What if it's what, what happens if it's not, does that trigger something then if it's below the floor standard? Um, it, it more than likely trigger an inspection and it would certainly raise alarm bells. You've got to bear in mind moving forwards, they're talking about the equivalent floor standard for next year 
being 85% in reading, writing and maths. And the, the DfE at the moment is saying that 90% of schools will fall below that. Which means that those 90% of schools will be reliant on progress to avoid falling below the four targets for both. It's a really, really significant issue, particularly for junior schools. Um, one other thing that's in the infant raise online is information around the phonics screening check. This is broken down by group. Um, you can have a look at the school percentage here of 68% compared to a national of 74%. Okay? And that's broken down by group. Mm -hmm. And it might be that governors are wondering when attainment is so high by the end of year two, mm -hmm. what is it about this measure that means that our mm -hmm. children perform slightly lower than the national? And that's the sort of question governors might want to ask at the mm -hmm. January meeting. And there's some more information mm. about the spread of marks for the phonics screening test mm. compared to the national spread of marks here. Mm. So, attainment data thresholds. Here we are, this is junior school uh, mm. only. You can see here that this is the proportion of children achieving levels 4 and above in key stage 2. And these are our results for this year. It's the first time for a very long time that we've seen greens on a junior raise online. But you need to bear in mind that this is an attainment measure. So again, your understanding that these children arrived in key stage 2 attaining significantly above the national average. Okay. And this is broken down further <coughs> by groups, so you can see the comparators for the school compared to the national. Okay. So, children with English as a first language, 96% uh, of the, in school achieve level 4 plus. The national figure there is 90%. That's why that's significantly better. Okay. And clearly, if there's no colours, then it's not significantly above or below. Here's the average point score, and we're back to the infant school now to look at the average point score. So you can look across the top and you can see for all subjects, the average point score for school is 17.3 compared to a national of 15.9. Okay? That wouldn't be significantly, they wouldn't regard that as significantly. Uh, yes, but the colours aren't used on this report within the key stage one raise online, but we saw earlier on that it was highlighted as significantly better wow. on that first sheet where we looked at the average point scores. Okay. But it isn't broken down by colour as it is at key stage two. Why is that? No idea. Yeah. I went through and highlighted it in colour myself. Yeah. And, and especially when you look at some of the closing the gap reports that are now in there, actually I really think it's well worth unpicking some of the data that's in there and asking some questions about that because you are literally left with a, 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 there's a there's a guidance sheet with questions on there but actually it is virtually a page of data on that key stage one closing the gaps report. So you can go through and you can look at areas of strength and areas of weakness compared to the national. Okay, So we've already highlighted 18 compared to 16.5, one and a half points above in reading, 1.4 above in writing, 1.1 above in maths. So the children are not as far ahead in terms of attainment in maths as they are in reading and writing. 
but we know that it's still significantly above. But it's not quite as much above as we did in my time. And again, that's broken down. You've got here a group, you see, you've got, if you, if you look at any of the whites background at the top, you can see that in our school there are four children in that cohort of 120 with an average point score of 16.5 compared to 15.2 nationally, but it is only four children. So that's where you'd want to proceed with caution. And in fact, if you go back to this previous page and you look at these numbers, you've got nine children there, for example, other than English, I believe to be a better. So nine children with English, not as a first language. Now that group of nine is below the national for groups with English, not as a first language. You might look at the, you might ask the question, why is that one of the only ones that is actually below the national? But when you look at that group of nine children, there may well be other factors in there. They might largely be boys, they might have special needs, they might be free school meals. And here's the average point score by pupil group at key stage two. Again, on this report, there, there are no colours. But you can, you can do exactly the same exercise. You can go through each subject and each group, and you can highlight where the school performs well, and you can highlight where the school underperforms compared to the national. Okay. So just to highlight one here, free school meals. Uh, school, APS 28.2, national is 27, non-free school is 29.4, national 29.4. So, with a statistically significant group of 43 there, the average point score for free school meals is significantly above the national at 27. But overall, it's in line with 29.4. Okay. Um, and again, this unpicks it by group. You can see that some of the numbers down the side here are statistically very small. You certainly wouldn't want to be reading anything into the performance of white and black Africans from that one child. So that's attainment. So you look at that and you think that the infant report is significantly above in almost every respect and has been consistently for the last five years. There have been, there's been no real statistical significance in the junior school compared to the national, but there have been the, the green sheet, you call them green shoots of recovery, but there are the green boxes on there for the first time. But I think that the, the thing that you need to do is to go through that data in a little bit more detail and just unpick what any issues they are, where there are significant differences that might, might not be highlighted by the blues and the greens. Progress data, we're talking largely about junior schools and primary schools now. Um, I'm going to think to start with about expected and more than expected progress. I've only selected a very small number of the tables relating to progress from the junior raise online because if we were to put it all in this presentation we'd be here literally for hours. What this is then is it looks at their level at key stage one on the left hand side and it looks at how many of them convert to two levels progress here and three levels progress here. So if you just take one line, if you take 2C here, and this is in reading, 12 children achieved a 2C at the end of key stage 1, 10 out of those 12 achieved the expected progress, that gave us 83% compared to a national of 84%. So what you're looking for here is significant variation in this column in the schools achieving column compared to the national. But actually you look at reading there and for expected progress, aside from perhaps wanting to look at that group of four children working at level one, 
who didn't all, only, only four, sorry, that group of six children working at level one, of whom only four got to a level three. That's where you get that 67% compared to 84, but that is two children missing out again. It, that might be of absolutely no significance if you were to see the names of those two children. Because there may well be contextual factors that, have, uh, that, that provide the explanation for that. What you can say though is when you look at more than expected progress, you do begin to see a little bit more variation. Okay? So 26% making more than expected progress compared to 35% nationally. That is significantly worse for maths and writing. Okay? So this is the best of the three reports in terms of expected rates of progress. And that means that anybody that's coming in to review the junior school or inspect the junior school is going to be looking at this issue of challenging the more able, accelerating progress, accelerating learning. Because in some respects that's the Achilles heel still in the data this year. Okay. Um, that's broken down for disadvantaged pupils. Disadvantaged pupil is the new definition mm -hmm. that's included for children on free school meals within this report this year, pupil premium children. Um, so you'll see where pupil premium children are separated out, it's exactly the same percentage. Okay? But you can see the conversion rates here. What you don't get to see from this, which I think would be really interesting data, is how disadvantaged pupils at our school compare to disadvantaged pupils at other schools. You're only shown the national for other schools, the national for your school, and how disadvantaged pupils do compare to those two measures. But again, this is actually a really valuable report, although you've still got to bear in mind the numbers at these levels here. Um, and I think the trend that we're actually picking up across both schools is that it's the more able disadvantaged pupils where the issue begins to get more significant. Um, then it looks at what percentage of each group made the expected rate of progress. Uh, so you can see that boys in maths was significantly lower this year. But there was nothing else really of any great significant statistical difference. So you get to SEN in maths and nothing else. Now, just by means of a comparison, almost all of those boxes last year were blue. Okay? And we'll get to a page where there's lots more blue in a minute. But last year, the fact that there are no blues there shows a significant movement forward. Okay? But when you come to look at progress data in terms of value added, this is where the overall picture becomes a little bit more blue. So this is that value added score now based against the 100 that I was talking about. So you can see that the value added uh, overall 98.2, 97.3, 98.6. So this year is the highest value added that we've had in the last three years. And it's got an arrow pointing upwards to show that it's a significant upward trend. But it's still significantly below the national of 99.8. The junior schools only ever hit 100 mm. once in one subject in one year. schools performed in terms of value added since the beginning. That doesn't include science. Okay. Um, so value added, the value added measure remains a key issue. You can look at... Okay, so this looks at each individual child and plots them uh, clearly expected progress is here so anybody above this line is doing exceptionally well and anybody mm. below is not doing not making the expected progress okay and 
uh, target tracker will be able to do exactly the same sort of job as this does and pick out uh, who those children are for you. I mentioned the other ones above and below. Uh, are we closing the gaps with people premium, now called disadvantaged children in the uh, new Raise Online? These are the new reports, just to give a bit of perspective to this. If you look at the gap at key stage 2 between free school males and non-free school males in 2012, it's 17%. And that gap gets bigger. And we know that we've got a non-entry gap in reception from the baseline. This is the new report now. So this is an infant school causing the gaps report. So this will be new to everybody. Looks at the number of disadvantaged pupils in the uh, school. Looks at their average point score. Compares it to the national and then looks at the difference. So if you look at the all subjects first box. The, and this is where I went through and I used blue and green myself to colour these in where I thought it was significant. Because disadvantaged pupils are 0.4 below the national average for all pupils and then 0.9 behind other pupils within their cohort. Okay. So what's interesting for me is the yellow box there where disadvantaged pupils in 2014 in all subjects performed higher than the national. Now that is really significant. But you balance that with the fact that they are 1.2 points behind the rest of the cohort. So we do have a within school gap, 1.2 points is in effect half of the group being a fine grade behind. So if you think about it in terms of 46 pupils, that's 23 of them being a fine grade behind. And you can go through and look at that for reading. And for the first time this year, we have disadvantaged pupils outperforming all pupils in other schools, or at least the same as, apart from in maths. So slightly above for all subjects, the same as for reading, 0.2 above for writing, and 0.1 behind in maths. But still an average points gap of about one to the rest of the cohort. Okay? This is Another new report that's in there, this is about now moving away from the average point score, it's now looking at attainment levels and you can see what proportion of disadvantaged pupils attain a level 2 or above and you can compare that to the national and you can also look at the within school variation and you'll pick out from this again that disadvantaged pupils at level 2 or above are doing exceptionally well compared to the national. And the within school gap is nowhere, I mean, it's minus 1 in reading, 1 in writing, and 4 in maths. I would argue that there's no real significance, especially if you look at 2013 and the within school gap of 17% in writing. That's quite a significant gap. So that is very, very positive data. But when you look at level 3 and above, this is where you might want to think about asking questions. Because more able disadvantaged pupils don't do quite as well comparatively. And you can see that the within the school gap is really significant, 23%. So an offset inspection team coming to the infant school with this new information might just be asking questions around how well disadvantaged pupils who are more able, how well their needs are met. And it looks like how well their needs are met across the curriculum. But it's just about asking those questions. As you would expect, the Junior school information is slightly more complex. 
because this is now beginning to look at it in terms of progress. And this does highlight in yellow where progress is significantly better and in red where progress is significantly worse. Okay. And you can do exactly the same thing, spend a bit of time scrutinising this, seeing how well disadvantaged pupils do in terms of progress. Okay. Here's the value added for disadvantaged pupils over three years. And you can see how disadvantaged pupils compare to other pupils and you'll see that in 2014 we've looked at attainment being a fairly positive picture but when you look at actual value added it gives a slightly different picture. So the attainment of free school meal pupils look fairly positive, there are questions to be asked about why free school meal pupils don't quite make the same amount of progress as the rest of the cohort. And that's broken down further in, you can see here, the within school gap. Now actually, if you look at the trends over time, in the last three years, the within school gap is on a downward trend across all subjects. A significant downward trend. So whilst there are still issues there, the three year trend is a reasonably positive one. Now clearly, whichever school is inspected, we would need to have evidence as to how disadvantaged pupils are performing for current cohorts. And that's why that those expected progress uh, tables and how the, the free school children perform in the context of those is going to be vitally important in terms of evidence. But actually, Joe and I looked at this the other day, and apart from one, well, two cohorts, the gap is a narrowing one and it's not significant. So we have very positive within cohort data. There's some more. But as I said, this is only part of a lot of data in these reports now. This is when you get to level five, and you can see the variation um, for the more able pupils, uh, disadvantaged pupils, and you can see the difference to the national is significant there. That's interesting because that's the first time that we've picked out, that's the first time we've been able to pick out a common issue across both schools. Now, there's no analysis here, there's no reason why, we need to think about what the reasons are. But the key question is, why do more pupils, more able pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds not make the same progress as other able pupils nationally. And that's what this is about really. There is a lot more data in the reports and I did say that I'd send them round. It's, a, it's about drawing conclusions, it's about formulating hypotheses. There's an offset data dashboard for governors now. We can look at the Fisher Family Trust information. Um, we've got raised online, we've got the school's own data. It's about looking at all of the information that's available as a whole and using it to inform your self-evaluation, which is then making sure that your school improvement plan is targeting the right things. From a governing body perspective, they need to think what other data they like, whether they need data on people's attitudes, participation in sport, behaviour. Goes back to some of the work that we did with governors around values and what, what it is that we value. And if we, for example, do have uh, children's happiness at the heart of what we do, how do we measure that? Barack Obama said this, but I've heard several Ofsted inspectors say this that some schools just weigh the pig too much and don't do anything about it, and the pig does not get any bigger if you keep weighing it all the time. Um, there are some questions for governors here, and I'll send this presentation around when I, when I send the online around. 
that's what the National Governors Association view is in terms of asking challenging questions. I think there's some key messages. For me, that second question there, using Raise Online to ask robust questions is really important. It's also really important to make sure that um, it's focused on the future. We've already looked at the fact that it's a historic document, that the children that left in year six have passed through seven years worth of their time here, that the children that the year two data for have had three years of education within the infant school. And actually it's looking about what the current trends look like in terms of moving future cohorts forward. So it is about using it sensitively. It's certainly not something that you use to make a judgement with. Even Ofsted would not make a judgement with it. If they had, the junior school's outcome from their Ofsted inspection last year could have been even worse. But actually, they looked at the quality of teaching and they looked at the current data for current cohorts and saw something different, which, which led to a more positive potential experience, uh, experience than we might have anticipated when we got that data. So the key is, Raise Online is about looking back and governors look forwards. And I think from a senior teacher point of view, if there's one thing for us to think about here, it's we've picked out one real specific issue around um, more able free school meals children, but which, which other ones are in there? What other things can we glean from these reports that might help inform our improvement journey moving forwards?